First of all, this video is not me dropping trout and taking a big old dump on the chest of exercise science, okay? It's not what this video is. It's not what this video is. That's a different video that I have planned in a week or two. So we're going to look at the most recent meta-analysis, which has some very, very interesting conclusions and potential implications for how you approach resistance training. Now, the conclusion is, overall, our main findings suggest that there is no evidence to support that resistance training performed to momentary muscular failure is superior to non-failure resistance training for muscular hypertrophy. Now that's the conclusion from the abstract at the start. The conclusion from the end is our main findings show that resistance training performed to set failure is advantageous versus non-failure resistance training for muscular hypertrophy with a trivial effect when studies applying any definition of set failure are analyzed. Now, one big thing is we have to ask ourselves, who is actually being studied? Who are the studies actually being conducted on? Now, if someone is untrained, it doesn't have a lot of carryover to trained lifters, especially with regards to proximity to failure. If you are untrained, you are very, very sensitive to training, so it makes sense that you don't need to go anywhere near failure. Untrained lifters often see gains, yes, muscular gains, from doing cardio. So yeah, they don't need to go to failure. Also, they are not as resistant to muscular damage because they don't have access to the repeated bout effect by definition of being untrained. And so they might undergo and experience large amounts of muscle damage from going to failure, which might actually be counterproductive. But if you're trained, you don't have that same situation. Now, in the first section of this meta-analysis, they used seven studies, only two of which were on trained lifters. So the majority of the data, at least from that section, I don't think is going to be useful if you are a serious hardcore lifter who is driven to get results. Now, these other two trained lifter studies, the first one, they had to be resistance trained experienced with a two to three times per week training frequency. Most serious lifters that I know are not going to the gym two to three times per week. Some are, but most are not. Minimum of two years, maximum of five years. Fair enough, I guess. They, they want people in a certain window. Only recreational resistance trained individuals with no regular participation in other sports, such as bodybuilding, powerlifting, or weightlifting. So if you're doing those, you're out. In addition, only individuals not having ingested ergogenic aids or any type of nutritional supplements affecting muscular performance for 12 weeks or longer. So if you take creatine, you're out. The other trained study included 14 participants, age 23 on average, height 172 centimeters on average, body mass 74 kilos, on average, resistance training experience, 5.1 plus or minus 2.6 years. Now, if you plug these numbers into an FFMI calculator, we don't know the body fat percentage. I just put in 15%. Could be 20%. Could be 12%. Kind of unlikely. I mean, that's already very, very lean. 174 centimeters, 74 kilos, 15% body fat equals 21 FFMI. So I don't know what these guys have been doing for five years, but it hasn't been very productive. plug in 20%, which I think is still pretty reasonable. That's about where I am. It's about 20 FFMI. So are these guys trained? Kind of, but are they going to be relevant to someone who's really, really serious about maximizing the results? Probably not. I remember four or five years ago, people started talking about how zero reps in reserve was the same as two reps in reserve. Like it didn't matter if you did those two reps or you didn't do them, like your results would be pretty much the same. You know, the fatigue is too high. You're going to burn yourself out. Don't train to failure, etc. Two reps in reserve. That's where it's at. That's the money zone. Then a few years ago, it was like three reps in reserve. Like that's, that's about the same. Like we can't find any difference in the literature between zero reps in reserve and actually failing and, and three reps in reserve. Now I hear people talking about five reps in reserve. Like you can keep five reps in reserve and still get the same results. I'm calling bullshit. And around 2018, I started doing very, very high volume because a lot of studies were pointing that that was the way to go. You look at the Schoenfeld study, nine weekly sets gets you 0.5% growth, almost nothing. 27 weekly sets gets you 1.7% growth. I mean, it's more than three times as much, but it's still not that great. 45 weekly sets got you 20.8% growth. So you see this massive jump from 27 sets per week 
to 45 sets per week. And so I started doing super high volume. And I still was training to failure because that's what the study said. It said, hey, all these people are training to failure. And I got injured. I got burnt out. I started having a lot of issues. And slowly I realized the people aren't doing this. They're not actually training to failure. No one is doing 45 sets for quads and going to failure. They're just not. And we should not sit here and try to act like this is an exact science. This study, this recent meta-analysis, it is actually suggesting that there are multiple definitions of failure and that is a problem. And it's trying to quantify that. But this is going to be very, very difficult to quantify because most people don't train that hard. The velocity loss condition was, I think, 25% velocity loss. That was a high proximity to failure. That might be four, five, six reps in reserve for a lot of people. 25% velocity loss, that's not a lot. And if you look around in the gym, most people are not training to failure. And so when research participants say like, oh yeah, I did an exercise science study and it was like the hardest thing I've ever done, that doesn't mean a lot. Uh, I don't remember, and uh, I mean, I, I don't carry out the training myself, my research assistants do. So I, I don't remember, I certainly have that data, but I, I didn't look through that. That wasn't something that I examined. When the researchers themselves are not even showing up to the study, they're not even looking at their own data. It's mostly untrained individuals. You're having to teach them how to squat when they're doing the workout. Do you think they're really giving the same kind of effort if you're someone who's really trying to maximize your physique? I mean, look at the term volitional failure. It means you willingly stop the set. That's not failure. If I'm doing squats, it's not failure unless the bar ends up on the rack. That's not failure, okay? If it slows down a little bit and it's tough, that's not failure. It's just me stopping the set. Every muscle group is different. This could be just due to the leverages, which areas are gonna be exposed to more mechanical stress and tension. This could be just due to your training history, but every area is gonna be a little bit different. I can handle a lot more volume for my side delts or my rear delts or my traps compared to my spinal erectors or my hamstrings. They're just different and you have to treat them differently and you can't just outsource your instinct, read a meta-analysis and be like, oh, this is how I've trained. I've done that, it doesn't end well. Also, every exercise is different. You cannot equate a Romanian deadlift to a standing hamstring curl, okay? The strength curve is gonna be different. You're gonna be putting more or less mechanical tension. It's gonna be stressing different areas of the muscles. Regional hypertrophy is a thing. And so you can't just say, oh, this muscle, this many sets. It depends on the exact exercise that you are doing. Also, every person is different. Alberto Nunez recently talked about how he's doing eight sets per muscle group per week, and he's trying to lower his volume. I'm taking the same mentality now. It used to be more, 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 but when you do more sets, you either just can't recover or something else compensates. So your execution, your intention, your technique, or your proximity to failure is just going to go down because now you're thinking, oh, well, I have 44 more sets for quads this week. And I'm not some high intensity training bro, okay? In fact, I'm known for doing higher volume, but I still realize that you can't just copy a study or even take the results of a study and apply it to yourself without realizing there are other levers to pull. And so when a study says like, yeah, they all just took it to failure, their failure is almost certainly different from yours, especially if you know how to push yourself. And even for an individual, it's going to change over time. Perhaps your work capacity goes up, perhaps your ability to recover goes up, perhaps you're getting better sleep, perhaps your stress is lower, perhaps your diet is more on point, and you can actually handle more training, even to failure. I'm not one of these one set to failure guys. For a lot of muscle groups and a lot of exercises, you can do more and should do more than just one set to failure. But you should also not cheapen failure by giving all these other definitions like, oh, it was technical failure, oh, I didn't get a slight little piece of the range of motion, like that's my failure. On the other hand, your volume might go down over time. If you used to be training with three or four reps in reserve because you thought that was failure and you realize like, oh shit, I watched this guy's content and this is what actual failure is, well, now you might not be able to handle as much volume. It doesn't mean you're gonna grow less just because the number on the piece of paper that is your training log is lower. 
No, that's not how it works. Your body doesn't actually know exactly how many sets you are doing. And so stop chasing that number of sets. It's a byproduct from doing the correct amount of work. And the correct amount of work is going to vary based on what each set actually is. And a lot of people are getting really, really good results from a lower volume style of training, a more minimalistic style of training. I used to look at those people and be like, wow, they'd be so much better if they just up their volume. Look at the research. I don't think that anymore. I think especially if they are advanced, they are elite, they are experienced, they've either probably tried that or they know themselves. They know what is going to work for them. So if they have some kind of peculiarity in their training, whether it's like a little bit low or a little bit high or like they use a certain technique or something or there's a certain split, that's probably what is best for them. And to me, a lot of this research makes sense if you realize people just aren't training as close to failure as a lot of these serious lifters are. It explains the super high volume. It explains the proximity to failure because those two things are going to be very, very interconnected. The closer you train to failure, the fewer the sets you can do. And so when you have these people doing essentially glorified warmups... Yeah, you can handle a lot and you're going to need to do a lot if you want to benefit from that style of training. And as the years go by, I find myself relying on exercise science less and less. I still read it. I still consume a lot of content with regards to exercise science. I'll do a whole video on that. But I find myself talking to people more, people who are of the same mindset. I find myself observing their training, looking at what they're doing, their exercise selection, their technique, how they program. I find that to be much more useful than a study on people who literally don't even lift. I also find myself going based on my own experiences. Just, okay, what did I do that worked in the past? What might work in the future? Again, talking to people and just going back to my own experiences rather than a study on 100 people. Ooh, N equals 100, but it's on other people. I mean, five reps in reserve. That's so many reps in reserve. How many sets could I do with five reps of my 10 rep backs? Limitless. In a single session, 15, 20, 25, right? And probably still benefit linearly just because there's no fatigue and, and you know not that much stimulus either. Now, would that be better than one set to failure? It's hard to say. I think there would probably be a sweet spot where it's like one to two reps in reserve and doing more volume, but it's also going to be very based on the individual and you don't know exactly where you're going to be on that curve between proximity to failure and volume. And so you're going to have to experiment rather than just reading a study. A lot of people are losing that ability to go by feel and experiment in their own training. They're spending a lot more time reading the latest publication rather than just going to the gym being observant and trying to find out what works best for them. Anyway, for more information about that, you can consider grabbing a copy of my book, Finding Your Muscle Growth Formula. That's exactly what it is. There are zero references. It's not anti-science by any means, but it is more about giving you the tools needed to undergo that process. All right, that is all for this video. Thank you so much for watching, and I will see you in the next one. Peace.